Okay, this morning we're going to talk with Jimmy McCullough, who has lived in Nipigon all his life, and he's got lots of stories to tell. So, Jim, you're on. Whatever you oh, thank like you, Glenn. Thank you for the wonderful job you're doing in this over the years and everything. Uh, I'm going to tell the three McCullough brothers come to Nipigon in 1937, and uh, they there was no work out in, uh, in the West. And so they come to Nipigon. That was uh, Mac, Vi, and Jim, and Daisy McCullough married uh, Mac, and they live in a little right near where the new flying post is getting. That's where they pull their trailer in there, and then when they got a place to stay at for John Sallow, at John Sallow's place uh, on top of the hill, close to where the fire hall, right on the edge. That was John Sallow and his little stone buildings, and that's where they lived for the next possibly five years. They were here when the bridge was built, I guess, something like that. And uh, I'm not looking at my notes yet, but uh, my cousin Evelyn got killed there sliding down that hill. Don't slide on hills, uh, people. Uh, there's quite a few children got, did get killed nipping on sliding on hills onto the roadway and run over by a truck. And Mac McCullough's way up on the highway, uh, building Highway 11. My dad was in Europe, and Uncle Vi was probably in Europe also at that time. And he had to drive to Thunder Bay. She was still alive, but her guts were crushed or something for the truck. And uh, so I met a Dr. McCullough that was there. And uh, we're probably related way back, yeah, probably, but didn't still charge him. In those days, it wasn't free to see a doctor. And so that was happened there. And then he moved to this house in 1945. I asked my cousin Rosie, 1945, and I come from Europe. I was born 1946, um, February 25th, in Perth, Scotland, nine months after VE Day. So I think I'm a celebration of VE Day by my parents. So I was born in Perth, and adding to that is, um, oh, what's his name? Harold Michon, who was in Five Company, my dad also, his dad, we we're all in Five Company, and he was born in 1943 in Aberdeen, Scotland, so we both had born in Scotland, Harold and I, and uh, I could tell lots of stories about five company out of Nipigon, Red Rock area, lots of names, but I'm digressing again, uh, probably will a few times, but uh, uh, then I come to Nipigon, and we stayed in my Uncle Max on the veranda, which is no longer there, Larry Rory's house right now, they took the uh, veranda down, and... Uh, so Jimmy, was the, was Mac build that house or it was already there? That was there. I, I can't remember. Sanderson built the house in 1905. Larry knows the dates on that house. Gorgeous. And gorgeous it was, house inside. Oh, yeah. yeah. I was there. I, I grew up in that house and went to the big parties. In fact, I went through the last half an hour looking at pictures of my Uncle Max place with Louis Bell. Nobody remembers Louis Bell, unless you're old like me. And McLaughlin, Tom, Tom McLaughlin. Yeah. We had a big gang always eating there and Rosie. Uh, I think John's gone by that time. But uh, Melvin, and then uh, we had to move out of the house. Dr. Jeffrey was a doctor, my only doctor my dad trusted. My dad had bad emphysema, working in sawmills. And now I'm going to digress again. He got jobs in sawmill, working for a guy named George Stanger. Anybody ever heard of George Stanger? Yeah. Stanger Circus, yes. Yeah. And he was, that was up in Nippon. And he got jobs, he was a detective. The Chinaman in the Chinese laundry was uh, cheating him, so... George had my dad go to young father as a detective and find out what's going on. Then my dad worked on a milk wagon with him. And George Stanger, he's a great big German fellow with a name. Now I realize what he was. And he used to ride the motorcycle down Nippon, the streets of Nippon, muddy, no paved, on standing on the seat, on a motorcycle seat. George Stanger, I can't picture him. George and Sue Stanger. And uh, anyway, that's how we got to know Stanger. I took him out fishing. He went fishing down at the Black Bridge. There's George Stanger, all the kids... And George, we had a fishing rod, and we took him up my Jolly Roger, and we fished off the boat, and uh, it was great. He always gave us kids free rides. So that's another digression. So anyway, we were in this house here at uh, Mac McCullough's, and we had to get out. It was too busy a place, too much going on at Mac McCullough's. So we bought the little house, or rented a little house, a little red house where Cookie Dampier's house is right now. And right next to us was Beauclair's. It was the same company as my dad. And where Jimmy Sallow is building his new house, that was Storval, Bork Storval lived there. He was also my dad's company, Five Company. There was quite a few people. McAllen, uh, Five Company from Red Rock. He was uh, he was a lieutenant in there. And uh, what's his name? Huey Ryla. There was dozens of people around the Nipping On area that were in Five Company. 
and lots of native people like Harold Michon's dad. So uh, they, the, the First World War was all privatized, but in the Second World War they made, I, I got the book from Sumi, got it for me. There was five, 30 companies, and I didn't know, there was, my dad never talked about it, but there was 30 companies, and dad was five out of uh, Thunder Bay, nipping on area pretty well. And he was bad shape. He working up in Auden on the sawmills. He couldn't get work. My dad, my Uncle Mac was a hoistman, drove all the piling in on uh, Lake Helen, down nipping on river. And Vi got work somewhere along that line too. But my dad couldn't because three brothers from north of the west, they couldn't work. And you know, the, the locals complained. So my dad stayed home a bit. But since he was a sawyer, he got a job with uh, Johnny Aho, the Aho subdivision down where I grew up down there. And uh, also Leo Lesby, he moves Leo Lesby sawmill from, that's why they call it Calios uh, Road there, the strip. That was Calios, Jack Calios sawmill. And uh, Leo Lesby bought it with all his money and my dad set it up from on top of the hill where uh, Jimmy, uh, James Dampier, James uh, Nichols has his, that was uh, Leo Lesby sawmill way back in those days. So uh, uh, then we were there for a couple of years and up in that little white little house and my dad built the house in 1948 we were there because my uncle Mac, uncle Vi got killed in a hunting accident shooting didn't look here's the noise in the bush and my uncle shot my other uncle that was happened so it was sad but they were hunting and shooting the noises you don't do that so Jimmy go back for a minute yeah. the house is was where the, the house he built, you just... Oh, said. right down in Newton Street. I think it's 82 oh, oh, uh, on, Newton I Street. Oh, okay. Came, right. And it's a real, I don't can say what kind of color it was. Mm -hmm. Marie right. on the scavenge calls a different color. Uh, Dale Ray lives there right now. Okay. It's the oldest house. It's got sawdust and boards. And my dad built that house. I just went through a bunch of pictures for half an hour at home, all the old pictures uh, from those days. I, I was too young. Uh, and it shows Maureen Dapier, Helen Rhodes, and the gang around her house. And a guy named Claude Paul, nobody knows. That's where Dave lives now from the liquor store. And I've got to tell a story there. Uh, so my dad was a sawmill and he worked for Johnny Aho. And he cut all the lumber for those houses uh, on that particular area. He built our house, a little front section on it, four rooms. And then the next house, my Hulchuk's wasn't built yet, it was under construction. And then, yes, we had lots of ethnic people in our area. We grew up, we were multicultural down in so-called, I hate to call it DPville, but down the valley, like Lorex used to say, we had Italians, Polish, Ukrainians, uh, lots of, we, and we all played, we had a great time, we fought together and everything, but we were down there, uh, and we built that, Claude Paul's house, uh, John DeZuba's house, that's where Wilbur lives now, and uh, Marie on the scavengers, Mike on the scavengers, so all the lumber, and I hear stories about lumber still being found in the walls uh, at Wilbur's place and uh, Tom, Tommy Sutton's place, he's in there now and to cut all the lumber and all sawdust in the walls unless they change it now. So uh, that's Jimmy, all. when your dad built that house, where would he have been working then? I don't or know how much he's working. He, uh, he could have been working uh, <clears throat> sawing for Johnny Aho. Oh, oh, he couldn't okay. work working for something. I just Johnny out because okay. he also worked for uh, Leo Lesby also, okay. different things. Okay. But he was, and that's the original Jack Calio sawmill went from the Calios Flats down on the highway over to Ivan Hill, and that little road goes off to your uh, left going out. There was a sawmill there. It's still a little space there. And that sawmill went Leo's, and now, but Miko told me there's not one piece left from the original Calio saw out at Maddis Road, out on, uh, oh boy, Maddis Road, yeah, at uh, Miko Lesby's place. He's still running that sawmill. And that's the original, but there's nothing left from the original Calios uh, sawmill. But I, I've been out there visiting and... Uh, so I got to know Miko just because I knew his dad, and uh, ha, that was so neat. He was cleaning the beaver up in the house, Leo Lesby, up at his house on the hill there. And I don't know what happened. I went by my bicycle usually, and uh, there he was. And so I wanted to stay alone. I picked up a set of keys. He'd been looking for them for two weeks in the grass. <laughs> was he ever happy to find a set of keys? So, uh, uh, so your, dad, that so your dad was one of the first ones to build a house on New Now, uh, oh. there's so many stories about oh. that area. Across the street was Rosentrotters. Emil and Doreen Ganyu, Rosentrotter. That's Irene Luce's sister. Right. And I, my mother was a very good Catholic. My brother was, uh, his, uh, he was uh, baptized and uh, the woman was Irene Luce. She's a young girl out playing baseball. Went out and grabbed her. She's a Catholic. Or uh, baptized my, my brother Clifford and then 
Irene reminded me of that once in a while. <laughs> and she went back playing baseball again, wherever they were. Oh, I got lots of stories of those stories. Anyways, uh, we couldn't play them because they weren't Catholic. Bobby and Roy crossed the street. My mother was very, I couldn't even visit my Aunt Lil because she was very, just come from the old country. She come in August and there she come to Canada off the ship and lots of ladies had to go back. There was nobody waiting from no ranch, no castles in Canada, all the soldiers stolen stories. But my dad had a ticket for her and she come to Nipping on. She never saw tar paper shacks. She never saw native people. Never saw snow in her life. They just recently, not a few years, getting snow on the west coast of Ireland, around Galway. They're getting snow now and climate. So, and he lived with Pete um, Moss. That's where they heed the house. Her old house is still there, three or 100, 400 years old, still slowly sinking into the whatever's there. Uh, nobody lives in it anymore. And uh, so she come. And then uh, they built that house. And now in the winter time, that first winter, I don't know what year that would be, maybe. I was born in 46, so two years old. Maybe winter 47, whatever. They were in that house. And uh, she had to go down from that house, Dale Roy lives, all the way down to the water pump where uh, Henning Peterson lives now. And there was a water pump there, and right in the middle. And Nietzsche lived there too. The little family, two rooms, and about eight or ten people in that little house. I delivered papers to them. I got a story there too. Uh, well, I got to tell that one. The kids, they all come around me. I delivered papers there. And <laughs> they used to take a little piece of paper and they'd uh, give it to me. And I'd punch holes in my punch when I go collect in those days. So then some got smart. They folded up in about 10 pieces of gold thing. And I punched that one and oh, I got a whole bunch of holes. <laughs> so that was that story there, the children there. And uh, so uh, I had to go down there and get water and then back up in the winter on the sleigh. I, Newton Street was there, but that was the old road down to the... Uh, when I was very young, the old mill was still running, and the original road went from my, where our house was, through her Jico's uh, live now, back up in behind the plywood mill, that old trail. That was the old original road to the to the uh, old mill, and then they built Newton Street down there because the power went through, stuff went through, so they had to build some more, a better road down there. So, uh, anyways, we lived there. We, I had a wonderful, I had Christmas, uh, regular Christmas, and Ukrainian Christmas, and Fred Boholi, I just found some pictures of Fred Boholi. My, I got a big box of pictures I'm looking at just now. I'm looking for a better picture of the of the coal chute. There's one somewhere, I, that one's pretty faded. And there's one laying down there. And uh, I wanted to get, a, I found another one. There's no picture of the coal chute. Uh, you're not gonna see this on the video, but come on to the museum and you'll see it. And there's the coal chute over there. My Uncle Max, don't want to put the camera there. Uncle Max um, boathouse and the old black wooden bridge when I grew up and all the, uh, the blacksmith shop all in Lipping on Lake Timber. And I hung around old Maddie, the, the blacksmith, all the red buildings down there. This is 1960, but it probably dates way back what got the shacks in there. But um, so anyways, uh, I got it back to Newton Street again. And then they uh, lived there. And then uh, so when Pine Porch went down, uh, the Aho subdivision, you go to the town, it's called Aho subdivision. Uh, they... Uh, all the houses started to come in. I remember Al Anna Kowalczyk come in. We had the phone, and 125J in those days, it's in the phone book over there. And uh, she came to use her phone. The big blizzard, this Polish woman, not talking English, come in to use the phone. They had a half, she, I don't know how many, two or three houses. These are Donna Cohn house, board houses, built for one or two years construction at Pine Portage, and moved them in to fill all the streets up on uh, the Ajo subdivision. And she brought the houses in. And uh, used our phone. That's the first time I saw Anna Kowalczyk. So lots of houses. Now I got to talk about. And uh, so uh, eventually we got our. We had a fire in 1951 uh, when I was in grade one, and I had to go down underneath Anna Kowalczyk's house in the basement. And I stayed with Jerry and Helen Rhodes. Jerry and Helen just moved to Nipigon. He was a messenger or something at the old station. Seeing our, it was very busy down there. Art Criff used to drive the. Is that any Mark Criff? No, Anyway, Mr. Criff used to drive the CN box, the big truck called the, the freight, because there was no perlator in those days. And the freight came in the CN, and he'd pick it up. And another Rodenchotter story. I'm going to jump around, but that's okay. You get it down. Uh, Emil Rodenchotter worked on the railway, too. He was actually, I saw in the mill the last few years, he was driving the CN truck, picking up the paper at uh, Red Rock Mill way back. But he used to, his job, and... and Barbara Riley told me this. His job was to go down on the Y. If he'd been down to the hiking trail on the Y by the sewage, he, the train would come in from Red Rock, and that was his job to come in. And he'd pull in, and uh, that's where they'd change the train for going ahead, and they'd pull in there and back up, and then they'd go to Red Rock in the morning. And his job was to go clean out, grease it all, 
uh, fill up with water from the water tank, which had a wood stove in the bottom. I didn't realize how they kept the water, but they had a wood stove to keep the water in the tank um, warm so it wouldn't freeze. And uh, get coal chute, get the coal come down. And we played on the coal shots, kids. We had to climb up and down the coal chute that we had fun there, watch the trains, the steam engines. And uh, that was his job, Emil Rose Trotter, in a way, to bring the and bring it to Red Rock and whatever. And then they would uh, use it at the Red Rock Mill and bring the steam engine back because they didn't have no water and no coal chute and it, until they got the electric or the diesel. Then they didn't need this. And diesels have finished off. And i got to tell another little story. The water line is still there. When my Uncle Mac dug the ditch after the big flood in 59, he dug a ditch, diverted the creek all the way around, way out, flattened it, got rid of all the fish in it. But he did dig out the pipe. So I took a picture for the Gazette. I took another one on my camera. And uh, I painted it, I think it's yellow, caterpillar yellow. And I, they put it in the Gazette a couple times, I guess. So uh, when they were doing the pipe there a couple years ago, they were digging eight feet down, boring all the way down through. And the supervisor's there, and they saw the yellow pipe going across the ditch, and they shut down everything. Oh, go down, and they run down the ditch to see. But the pipe was full of holes, so they said, it was a gas line. So uh, that was a note in the paper. The water been off. Nobody can, they pick on complained about losing their water supply. It's been open for 70 years, so they never complained about the, the water. I painted again this year for some more pictures, but you can see it down where it crossed, and that come from the water. The pump house. And we played around there. We didn't stay in the dime pier boats, and they were in the harbor. Come on down, see the map here over here, and you'll see the little cove, and that's where all the dime pier boats are in there. It actually shows better in that picture. And there's that picture here, and I haven't got it more right here. It's got all the names of all the families on it. Down at the Kenny Dampier did this for me, got all the names of people who lived down there. And so this is on here, and that's from that picture up there. So, uh,. Anyways, no, I don't know where was well, I? I wandered around. Tell me, because I thought your dad ended up working at the liquor store. Okay, well, thank you for bringing me back again. You bring me back to the square one, because I'm, I'm, like I say, I'm rambling. There's so many little stories here, you know. Uh, going to be lost forever. And uh, so he worked the coal shoe for a guy named Dave Labine. I don't know if anybody remembers yeah. Dave Labine. And actually, he had the property where the new hospital built. The road going in, that was his property when they built the new hospital there. And he's, I don't know, he retired or what, and he spent a lot of time at the Playing cards at the taxi stand, Dave, mm -hmm. Fluss, Saw, Chuck, and all those guys. So, uh, but he lived behind a little shack and a little stove was there. So my dad was working on the coal chute, filling with bringing the gondolas. I still remember the gondola cars going down, and then you hear the bang, a bang, a bang as the as, uh, as uh, the conveyor lifted the coal out to the top to put in the big chute. And there one day I caught my brother, young fella. We were up there. We used to run up there at noon hour just for heck of it. And there you're dropping you know those sparklers, flares. He had dropped it down in the empty coal thing. I thought it was going to blow up. We used to go up and slingshot and shoot at pigeons up there. There were always pigeons. So we had, we had a great time playing around the coal chute. Two minutes to go. Uh, so anyways, he was there, but he had bad emphysema. He was he was a dying man. When my dad left Europe, the family saw him, I guess, in Galway, Kinvara. And he said uh, he's going to not do him very good. And now, so Dr. Jeffrey told him, and then Rose Skilling, they needed veterans in those days to work at the liquor store. So, uh, um... Rose Gillen, Al Rola, and went to Mantuaj after, I guess, and my dad, and there was about, I got a book, picture of them at the Plaza Theater. There was lots of people, Ken Hawthorne, oh, uh, not Ken, that was young fella. Ed Hawthorne running the theater was there. Jimmy Risk, Jimmy Ring would work there. <clears throat> Harold Lumsden come later on. Okay, you know what? We're going to wind up then, right there, <coughs> and he'll reset the camera, Jim, and then tell us about your dad and the yeah. group working at the liquor store. Yeah. Okay, we're back talking to Jimmy McCullough, and we ended up talking a little bit about uh, the liquor store and employing vets from the wartime, including Jimmy's dad. Yeah, he had to go work there, and it was very good, and uh, uh, that was the old days. You had to go in and sign the slip for what you want, and they give you a slip, and then they went in the back, got the thing, wrapped it up, and nobody saw it when he went out. Now it's like a, a grocery store when you go in there. Right. So, um, but he worked there for till 66. He was not supposed to be left alone, but at that time, uh, Rose Gillen and uh, the gang were planning the Nipigon Fish Derby, and the Legion was taken over in 1964. My dad wasn't supposed to be alone there. He had trouble over there, and uh, but he was there alone lots of times. He's not supposed to be left. And, uh, but they were, and that's the guys that started the Legion, got the Fall Fishing Festival, Legion Fall Fishing, took it over from the Elks, uh, whatever it was, the uh, other Poly Lake Fish Derby. Right. 
So Jimmy, the liquor store has always been in that spot. That right, right. that the Zechner's building. They paid rent right. to Zechner's. Right. And I used to go play. When he cleaned it in 1960 to get our TV, he went cleaning. He got 20 bucks to go and do all the floors. And, and I used to play in the boxes and hide around the ladders up in the racks. Right. And I got to one story. We got on mass, got home, and the police phoned us. Somebody phoned us. The alarm went off at the... Uh, something happened at the liquor store. So my dad drove up in his car all the way up. I went with him. I was a young teenager then, I guess, and went up and went in and walked around the liquor store. So while we're in there walking around looking, the police cars come up from the police station, which was down on Newt Street that time. And the sirens are going. They chased everybody away who was going to be there, but we were already inside there anyway. So <laughs> I don't know. The police cars had the sirens going. They were kind of late. So, no, he worked there, and then uh, he couldn't retire, and then they left Nipigon and went to B.C. But, uh, no, those are hard. We built on twice that house, my dad. We didn't have much money in those days. Didn't get big money in those days working at the liquor store. But uh, <clears throat> he liked parking until Ferdy got there. The salesmen always give them free booze all the time, and they had their little parties. And we had our liquor store parties at our house. We played hockey. Had one. I still got the hockey game. We had that on the table, and they played that. And I'm not going to mention my mother had all her 78s in those. They spread out, and they had parties at our place. They went to different houses for parties, house parties, liquor store crew. Okay. And one big guy went and sat on him and crushed about six of them. So I never put records on a chair to wheel anymore. But go back a little bit because you're talking all your dad's side. But tell us a bit about your mom because I remember her and the Catholic Women's League. She, you're right. She was a diehard Catholic. Oh yeah. Yeah, and and very and very involved, right, in the Cancer Society. No, no, just in the Catholic and, Church. She was president a couple times. She's also president of the Legion over here, the Ladies oh, Auxiliary okay. too. Right. She was over. They were both very active. Right. And uh, in those days, in the uh, 1950s and maybe towards 60, the Boy Scouts, we used to march, bare arms, down to the Cenotaph. Go out there right now, when it's November 11th, and walk bare arms. We were so proud. My dad had couldn't march with the rest of the veterans, and that was in front of the Hudson Bay store, and the sword was on her, and I got a picture of Corporal Hartley, the two Mounties, standing there. And uh, we used to march there and stand for an hour, giving out the wreaths in front of the, and the hedge was there. Then we marched back with Egan. Oh, Egan Nielsen was a yeah. troop leader, yeah. but Dale Antruck was his boy scout master. So we had great times in the Boy Scouts. Now they're yeah. two cadets and hoping to get more, but we were in the Boy Scouts. But my dad was there, and then he went over to the Legion and spent an hour in the Legion, had a drink with his buddies. Um, that's a Dampier pen. I don't know who's that one. And uh, I just got it from Danny Boone Dampier, memory of uh, on the Morning Star. But your mom, I just remember her being very active. Oh, she, and very Catholic, very, uh, I know, uh, very strict. We had the rosary all the time at our house during Lent. And, and the, the guys that stayed from the Royal Bank, we had to raise money uh, for to keep the house going. We didn't have much to keep. And they stayed, Hank DeMar stayed there, married Donna uh, Martin, Donna Collins now, and uh, lots of names. Um, we all stayed there, and they, Hank you stayed, lots of them knelt down and did the rosary with us too in those days. And... Uh, Actually, I'm in contact with his daughter now. He died a couple of years ago. He's the guy who taught me how to play guitar. He played the accordion. So we lots of parties in my our house during the 60s when Hank was there. And uh, he played with Alan Hanula. And uh, I couldn't join them guy. But we are place and played five foot two. Uh, we played a lot. We had lots of parties at our place in those days. So uh, when Hank was there. I, I just looked some of the pictures. So my mother, yeah, she was involved in a lot of... <clears throat> my dad was a quiet fellow, not like me. I take after my mother. My, my dad was very quiet. But you know, when, when the, on the troop train, when they were going through wherever, and my dad, they had him as uh, military police. My dad, little guy, MP. And they were in the car and they were making much noise. And my, uh, my dad would say, pipe her down. And they all did. My, my mother said, he just, he, that's the way. When you wear that, they don't, they don't argue with you. <laughs> you know, it, that's, it was sort of neat. But uh, George Martin, Gordy Martin's dad, rode back on the train with my dad from Halifax back to Nipigon, and he told me that stories about um, coming back with my dad to, to Nipigon. And I remember when George Martin got off the bus years ago and the kids were giving him a rough time and I realized who he was, so I told the paper boys were to leave him alone and he became own Lutz in Nipigon as way back, George Martin. But so, he was also in the army. My so dad. did your mom and dad ever take a trip back home? No, my mother went quite a few times. Did she? Yeah, she went back. She phoned, I remember talking to her mother when I was very small. But she went back the first trip by herself and then took Scott a couple trips, so oh. she went across. I was supposed to go. My second cousin, 10 years now, he's been a priest, he's an ordained priest. I was invited to everything, but I'm not a traveler to go to Ireland. I could have went. But I just didn't. And they sent me videos and pictures and they, uh, from my cousin in Galway. He's in the cathedral at Godway, Galway right now. 
but I'm in contact with him because uh, we're just email stuff, eh? Right. So I, uh, and then Scott showed me where, what I found on Google Earth, the house, where the original house and Scott was there many years ago, it's still living there. And the, the tide used to come in underneath the bridge, it's a stone bridge, the road, and there was a pool there. And then all the cattle went down to drink, Scott went down to have his bath. And then come back to where they got and the tide went out again. So that's the way he kept the tide clean, eh? Every, so, and their water come from the top of the mountain, three miles away on top of the mountain was where they got the water because uh, all the wells for three miles were seawater. They couldn't, uh, and that was on the edge of the burn, the most desolate place on the planet Earth, according to Oliver Cromwell, uh, the burn. Just talking about water, though, um, Jim, when yeah. you first lived on Newton Street, yeah. was there actually much water lines and stuff? Nothing. We had to go down the pump, and then Roden Trotters lived there, and there's a little shack with a couple people. Bill Brevo actually lived right. down there, yep. and the corner, and Terry O'Neill owns that, I think now that property, and there was no real nothing. The sewage wasn't even there plant. Okay. They did. It was all running right into the lagoon, uh, all the sewage right, right down at that place. That was, right. and my dad always said, "When well, don't eat, take, eat any fish out of the lagoon." Now we go to a guy named Danny my Dick, and he come around there pounding on the doors. It's Friday, fish on Friday, come and eat your fish, pounding on the doors. Coming up the street, my mom would lock the doors. He'd pound all him and the Lavoid boys. And I don't know where they got the fish from, but then anyways, that's down in my dick. Now, I went, did some research. I think his real name was uh, Dick Keast. Died about 1955. I looked on the uh, obituaries in Thunder Bay papers. And uh, he was an excellent carpenter. In fact, uh, some lady, I can't remember who was I was talking to, or listening to at that time, <laughs> she had, uh, he built her cupboards, her cupboards and her cabinets and her house still there today, built my father in law house. The secret went down to my dick, do not pay him. After the job's done, you pay him. Then he went and got drunk. So you don't pay him a lot for his done. <laughs> right. I just remember pictures of him. Oh, you got a picture of him? Yes, walking down Front Street. I don't know what it looks like even. We need that for the museum. That's an awesome picture. Oh. He's, he's a character, Fred Flush Sawchuk. Yeah. And, uh, but down in my dick is just legendary, and he was dead. We used to go on two trains twice, four times a day to get to St. Edwards and come back home, and he died in those little shacks by the railway tracks where he crossed behind the Spruce Park. So you there. must have a story about Flossie. Colin Campbell? Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, we went visit him a couple times well, out there, and call him and stuff. I a story about yeah. him. Yeah. But my main story, okay, we live in New Street. We had wonderful, we had two, Chris, two Christmas, uh, Ukrainian Christmas also. We played uh, pole to pole, two poles across the street. 20 or 30 children running there, and he, it was a, it's like a tie game. And they had the prison. And if you freed the first one, that one. If you freed this one, they all went free. And it was a, a goal game round. We played that, we played, that was called Gene Tootie also. Can can on the streets yeah. up for uh, Mrs. Road Street. We played there, can not in the main street. That's, and we went to, we didn't play there, behind Zechner's. Where John Zechner and all those guys, Gibson and Eddie Atwell, they played candy can behind Zechner's store in the lane. And it was all so full. So I had never much to do with people across the tracks, pretty well on this side of the tracks. So we had our own candy can. We played in the creek down there. And we built bridges and cabins down in the creek. That's what we did. And I just found another picture. <clears throat> uh, they asked Dave Labine, uh, could they put uh, gardens in on the CN property, right? you know, behind the houses? See, that is all bare. When Clyde Patton went through my parents' place in 48 with the horse and the plow, he took two truckloads of junk, garbage, from the blacksmith shop at the old trading post. That's where it was, right in that corner, way over in there. So that, when I told that to the guys from the, from the uh, history bunch from Thunder Bay, they, that nailed the map down for them. They found the, and that nailed everything down. But it was all, that was the end of that corner, all the garbage from there. And they had guards, everybody, uh, well, let me get some names here now. Uh, Unescavages, Dezubas, and, uh, and uh, well, Bill Baker, who was there before, Bill? No, they did. Bill wasn't put the garden, and then uh, Mahalchuk's at ours, we had big, all the way, all the stockos, all the way down the line, that was all dug by hand, usually. And the neighbors talked and stuff there. Uh, well, I got a story here. I want to talk about, everybody forgets about uh, Jerry Morso. Old Jerry. Now, uh, he used to build boats for us. He lived in a shack right across uh, the creek where the where trail goes now up in the parking lot. Towards here, he had a little green shack there. He was a squatter. And Mark Sobers knows about him and stories. But we used to visit him. He'd make bows and arrows for us out of hockey sticks. He'd carve them down. We'd go and get, and he'd tell us stories. 
I still owe Wilbur Allen a window because we're shooting at the at the target and I missed him and hit the window. <laughs> but went and seen Jerry all the time tell stories. When I went and got groceries for him, people went and got stuff for him, took care of him. But then we had another guy we don't want to remember. Uh, it's all written down here. Uh, Lee Miles. The real name was Leo Melanemi. Anybody heard of Leo Melanemi? Lots of stories of poor Leo. And we were down there, a bunch of us, Allens, Harold and Stanley probably, and a bunch of us uh, from school. We, they no longer lived in Nipping at that time. We went down to visit Jerry, tell stories. So you guys got to know Leo to, to appreciate this story. But we went back down over the creek, and, and uh, Leo found this old can, bucket, a eh? tin uh, bucket, and a pair of gotch. So he pulled the gotch on and got the bucket, and Jerry, I got a message for you. Jerry, we were all the four of five of us or six, whatever, our heads up on the bush there looking and watching Jerry, and all of a sudden the door opened a little bit, and the gun came out. Yeah, I got a message for you too, he said. <laughs> you want to see us guys run for it. <laughs> <laughs> he was a good guy. The other old fellow down there, though, uh, Jimmy, was next to Nietzsche's, and he chopped wood all the time. Yeah, I don't know who that fellow was. That I, old fellow there. Uh, yeah. Remember a little old man? Yeah, there was, that, we, I there was too young. Yeah, there was a couple little villages there, but I do know who built the house after was a guy named Russ McMinnemy. And that's another part of my life. I was spent out on the John C. And I went up in the John, I was lucky. I went in the John C. with Russ. Out there, and he let me run the, the tugboat. There, I'm barely a teenager running a tugboat out, heading, pulling that stuff, heading out to the bag. And uh, I used to go out in a, in a gym dandy with Jack and, and the gang. And come on, Jimmy, get your eyes on. I do that for them guys. Well, Jack remembered that one. And uh, it's Henry. And uh, lots of story went out with them guys. I was lucky. I, I had rafts. But after the big flood, that was it for the rafts. By then, we were in high school, I guess. But uh, and that's a true story of Jim's Rock. It's on my YouTube channel. And uh, Leonard and both did, and Greg Johnson, we had we built a big 12, a 16 foot raft, three, uh, 12, 12, three 16 foot logs and uh, four eight foot ones, and it was a big three man raft. We had lots of freeboard. We we're heading for the Mississippi, heading down the Nipigon River, pulling down the back channel. So we got in there, we jumped off at that rock and went up to here in Loon Poop and out to the no trail in those days now, out to the road and back home. Seven o'clock at night and uh, everybody's screaming, no newspaper, we're all delivered newspapers. So that's the true story of Jim's Rock. And uh, that's why we had to walk out to that rock. That's when we saw, let's go to that rock, we got to get going home. We heard the, the siren going up, I, pulled, I never know what happened that raft. So uh, you anyways, have, yeah. Do you have any memories of the plywood being built? Yo, I, we used to play there. Well, we, we hauled yeah. plywood in there to build cabins in the backyard. We had a skating rink in the backyard. This guy, and the kids would come, is the skating rink plowed yet? They wouldn't come over and help none of them. Too many of them. Anyways, uh, I got a picture of that. Billy Baker. Uh, they were they got with uh, Raul and a bunch um, when the kids playing our rink. I got I just found them again. To, they all got a picture of that. And Billy Baker remembers me. Please do not laugh. Do not encourage me. He remembers telling me tell uh, going out. You know I was a bad boy because I used to freeze snowballs put them in the freezer. And there I was on the middle of July chasing kids up and down the street with snowballs. <laughs> so I just remember that area being uh, open and it was yeah, just it was a park. recreation. It was, it was a park there. Yeah. That was, I got, we yeah. got pictures of the museum of that park area and we had cabins back in the trees and a guy named Honey Manella, that's what we called him, we, his real name was Roy Sr. But his nickname was Honey in those days so he had a cabin back in there and we played back in all the bush. We're all wandering around. There were barely uh, grade one, grade two kids playing down in the bush and down at the Dampier boats and all over the place. I don't know, nobody bothered us, and kids do that nowadays, you don't know what's going to, you know. Yeah. So we uh, we played the pump, I was watching all the bad kids pump, and the pump was still running in those days, so that was, I must, we must have been pretty young, playing down in the pump house gang. There's still people who used to swim down there in that area, that's where you swam. So, And I remember going rusty on that, and they pulled the old John C. right up, right up on the on the shore. They had the, the dead man, there's a big log there now, that's a dead man. That was buried, and had a cable, and that's the way you winched your boat up on shore with that one. Oh, lots of stories there in the lake. But, um, and we used to go to pictographs on my little Jolly Roger, that's later, when I got that in the 60s. But if the wood come down, you had to jump the booms. You got caught in the bag. And that's pictured behind me here, the bag, right, the pictographs. And you, that's why I wrote my little book and wrote the song, because it was 90 feet of water coming out there. The old charts, and I was on the, on the old Ugly Duckling, that's Jack's first boat, it sunk after mass at the, at the dock. 
And I saw 90 feet of water come right up from the pictographs, out. Never filled in until we had the big flood. There's only about 45 feet of water there now. But uh, the underground river, the pictographs, and the natives always said there was, they didn't get up. There was, they couldn't get up past Cameron Falls. The original Cameron Falls, they couldn't get up there. And so uh, that was maybe the way they went to uh, Lake Nipigon, up wherever, up Highway 11 way, we don't know. But that's uh, the underground river there, that deep channel. So. Okay, we're going to continue talking with Jimmy, and he's got two or three little stories now that he would like to add to his interview. Yeah, I'm going to start with Bobby Matchett. He was a Marine superintendent down at the landing, and for some reason, my dad worked on the lake. I got a picture of him on the tugboats, and he worked on Eileen G, which is the boat, Buster told me that's the boat. They fudged the name on the Legion. That's the Eileen G, Buster told me. It's, uh, that's kind of, there was another name for it, but that's the Eileen G, Buster said. And there was lots of boats around, uh, but he worked out, uh, working the boom, work on those boats, and uh, just on uh, the big ones, I don't know, I think it's the Nipigon, I got a picture of him on working on that. And I got him in a diver suit also, my dad worked up there. This is before the war, I think. So, uh, did I mention about going up to Auden, and uh, they were short, and they Go had... Go back and finish your story about oh. Bob Matchett. Oh, Bob Matchett, so he worked with Bobby Matchett there, and we walked there many times, uh, visit Bobby Matchett and family. And uh, I used to go visit Bobby on the, uh, he told me my Uncle Vi owned the whole side hill. That whole side hill right from the top where, um, uh, what's your name, uh, Janine Moore lives. Right. He, uh, it was a little shack up there, uh, um, that was Vi's, and he owned the whole side hill. But I don't know, I never heard that. Oh. And uh, so he gave it to Bobby, he said, if I don't come back from the war, it's yours. So whatever happened to come out, Bobby got most whatever. And uh, that was sold to the Smatello family back, and I remember going there. And my dad went down the street to John Patton, the end of the road, a little trail, a little road in behind. The original highway went down through town and down straight down where the trail is now to the bridge. And there was a little side road down where Smatello's house went, and old John Patton was there. And I remember visiting with my dad, old John Patton. And uh, the little guy with a funny little truck, he, uh, he did some plumbing in our place. And... Uh, Archie Sallow and, oh boy, my Uncle Vi used to take Archie Sallow and Howie Shaboyer fishing. <clears throat> my Uncle Vi, he was a great guy. Go out he'd take those two young fellows out fishing. So uh, uh, Clyde Patton was, and I remember going, visiting, and listening to, uh, what's his name, uh, Johnny Ackles. He talked with a slushy kind of talk, the way I remember looking at this little kid. My first ride on Polly Lake and a little three horsepower, his little cabin is still there. I go by, I said, that was Johnny Aho's camp. But my dad worked for him in the, in the sawmills. So uh, Johnny Aho, wherever that sawmill was. So <clears throat> Bob matched and then we went there. We were good for the family friends. One day I was down on the bicycle, and I stopped to talk to him. And, uh, Jimmy, I have to get back to work. The flies are biting me. Work's not getting done and all this stuff. I have to get back to work. But when I had my shoulder, I had to go to the hospital and stuff every morning or something, check with my bed. And he would drop his wife off there, but when he got back at 10 o'clock in the morning or something to that effect, he already cut a quart and a half of wood on top of the hill. He cut work in the morning. He was up at 6 o'clock wood up on top of the hill and behind all that birch. He was working in those days. I want to go to Mrs. Boholi. Uh, we had great, I can remember Fred, if anybody remembers Fred. Oh, where she lived? Uh, I don't know what number of Newton Street, Oops. but uh, Matt... Um, but she did live on think, Newton Street. Yeah, so. and... Uh, so one day I stopped by to visit her, and it was so long a story. But uh, I'm going to get, these are rough figures, they don't mean nothing. Uh, I think they bought the house for like $400 and got it shipped in to Nipigon from Pine Portage, the first part of it. And uh, <clears throat> in those days, Zector's store and Hudson Bay was there, I guess, groceries. But Zector's, everybody charged. Zector's store, people charged, my parents charged groceries there. And we did, all the farmer, all the people along that street, Brought their, my, remember my parents, turnips and potatoes in for the winter. All the gardens, everything went in for the winter. Everybody survived on that. But Mrs. Boholi was sitting there, told me lots of stories coming. But I'm going to tell the main uh, thing I, I remembered. Um, they didn't have very much money, and uh, Fred working here and there. And uh, anyways, Zechton was good to the people. That's just, she told me how good they got. They got the bed frames, whatever. And he helped everybody in those days. Zechter and all the people down there, and mostly all immigrants, we'll say. So that's all I can say. So one day, I told this to, um, oh my gosh, what's her name? <coughs> um, Doris Zechner, Doris 
uh, Williams. So I told him, well, she said, Jimmy, you have to remember, my dad was an immigrant too, she said. So he helped. Isn't that something? And you know, the Zechter family is still good. I got to tell a story. This is a new one. Uh, it's a true story, and I got to tell it. Uh, during the blueberry blast, we had the blueberry blast. We didn't get a free bus anymore. So we needed $500 to get the blueberry blast bus again, something, you know. So, oh, I'll go see. Uh, we had a meeting, and I said, I'll go ask Leslie, see what we can do. So uh, maybe they give us something to help us out, because Zechter's always very gen generous. So I went and sat in the office and uh, asked, well, see, we're needing money for the bus, and like, it's $500. Well, oh, I'll give you the $500, Jim. Yeah, I know it's a lot of money to ask for, I said, but, you know, $500 that we don't get it free anymore. Jim, I'll give you the $500. And I kept talking, we need this and that. Jimmy, I'll give you the $500. <laughs> that sort of it makes a point. Uh, now we're going to flip over here. i got to see what else I want to talk about. Oh, I did miss Maholi. What was the other one? Oh, uh... And then we had the, the pipeline go through in 1955. They put the pipeline, the gas, the water lines went in in those years too in the 50s. All the water lines, the streets are all built, waiting for houses down that area. That's why all the area built up. That was the new subdivision down there with all the pine portage, Donnacona on board, and you don't know which ones are hidden so well now, the houses. And there's only supposed to survive one year, but down there. And, uh, uh, but lots of those houses down there are, are plywood from the, our Donna Kona board, like Buffalo board, they call it, from Pine. From Pine. And uh, so, uh, anyways, we had the Hungarian Revolution, the pipeline coming through. And there was Alex Kovacs already stayed at our place taking pictures. That's where I got some of my pictures from Alex, developing backwards. And uh, he stayed in our house, a little room. And, uh, and our basement was full of junk, like my dad, it just, you know. And they had seven Hungarians living in that little garage at uh, where Cornelian and John Zygmunt lived, that little red garage. They had seven Hungarians on steel frame beds, spring beds. They were living in there, and they're trying to get work, and they were paying her 20 bucks a month to stay in there. No water, no sewage, no nothing. That didn't last very long. So they come and ask my mother, oh, so I went to school at 8 o'clock in the morning. I come at home at noon. The basin was cleaned out outside, organized. Everything was done. There was room for the, they moved the big freezer around everything, and they, uh, they had a place to stay for, uh, I don't know how many months. I don't think they were there the winter, but all summer. But they cleaned the basement out, and they were all students. And one was an electrician. They did fix stuff, for, stuff around our house. And my mother, we bought baking down for them and everything. And, and, and they played uh, with their hands behind their back, and they bounced the ball off the head and the heel, head and heel ball around our yard and stuff. And uh, so they're amazing students, and they stayed there. And they come back a couple of years later looking for another room, but they... Uh, uh, it wasn't available at that time. But they cleaned out, and so we got $20 a month and helped us. But they did clean out our basement, and then we made our own bedrooms down there. The Hungarians, uh, what else? What, were they looking for work here? Yeah, at the, on the pipeline. So some did and some didn't, so they support. But they're all students. The Hungarian Revolution, they got booted out of the country. Okay. So I was, again, I was a bad boy. They used to have a shower and washer and everything downstairs. Already. My dad already had that. So there was a pipe, a vent pipe or something, a little hole. So we could... Uh, and we, us kids, they were having the showers. So there was a water tap right there, a cold water tap. <laughs> so you guess what I was doing or some of us there. And the guys go for a shower, we turn the cold water on, and they get they start screaming because it was teaming in the shower. Bad boys, eh? But, uh, no, they were very good. And uh, uh, another thing is very much uh, the people all had the big gardens there. And uh, uh, everybody worked out in the gardens. Um, all by hand in those days, no rototiller, all dug by hand. And not in my first garden, I still got a garden this year. I'm still trying to keep a garden going, not as big as I used to. But uh, still the same side, but not like you. And we all had gardens, and uh, the, the veggies went in there. And big families, the stock was, I don't know how many. There's no stock was left in town. Tony on top of the hill. How many Winfields, the Gentile families all gone out of town? Yeah. So, uh, uh, and I got one more story. Uh, this is a Catholic story, the Catholic Church. Go in there, walk around. I've did a tour a few times. Uh, let's see. Uh, the front of the church is Pete Preet. That's from the Normandy Hotel. And Father Luigi blessed them. They had 75-year anniversary. And uh, they had them up in front. They were both towards, in their 90s, they're heading towards 100 and whatever. And Father Luigi blessed them and wished them another 75 years. The old man went. <laughs> so, anyways, if you walk around, you see Thompson, Thompson Drugstore. Um... Catholic League, I think I can remember them around there. But all of them are businesses. LeBlanc's on this side. Zechner's, LeBlanc's restaurant. 
uh, Thompson Drugstore, uh, the Video Hotel, the Gentile family. And uh, all these names all around. And up on top in the choir loft, there's John Mostrick, who is the superintendent, I guess, at uh, uh, for uh, in the bush. Uh, I think it was might have been Dom to our Brompton at that time, way back on the hill. I went to school with his son, Billy. And uh, then there's the other one, uh, Roy Winfield, that was the oil company down here, uh, the BA Oil. And that was the tanks we had drunk. They're all gone now. And uh, busy place is CN Station. My first agent, I remember Bill Long, Ben Long, and I used to learn papers there, Ben and Alta. And Billy Long bought the extra lot off my dad, and he sold it to uh, oh, a guy from like, Bill, Billy King or something from the States, and that's the house next to my dad's now. So uh, I don't know what, what uh, Dale talked to me. He doesn't know what he can do with the house. It's too old. It's not suitable. But uh, anyways, that's, uh, I think that's about it for my stories. I think I did everything there. Okay. So Jimmy's got lots of information, and I know he's going to get home, and he's going to say, darn, I forgot <laughs> that's this, okay. and I forgot that.